Welcome once again to our theological discussion of well, the book Salvation Belongs to the Lord by John M. Frame. We're on chapter 6, I believe it is, about man, the image of God. Man and the image of God. It's chapter 7. Chapter 7. So we'll be discussing that today. Uh, all right. So, there's a lot of questions that are asked in this chapter that they need to be explored, and uh, I don't know that we can uh, go to the depths of all of them today. But the Bible tells us that man, that is humans, are made in the image of God. And so we have to come up with it, with the understanding of what does it mean that man, that humanity, is made in the image of God. So that becomes the first question that we really have to explore. Uh, and then when we explore that, it, it brings up a lot of other questions as we go along. Questions about human, the human constitution, etc. So, the word man is being used generically this is one that the Bible uses, so we're going to stick with that. And we also use the masculine pronouns uh, because the Bible uses them, but they include both genders. Uh, Genesis 5, 2, God names the human race man, and therefore we're just going to stick with what God said <laughs> instead of trying to, to uh, what's the assign what's the best word for today. Because the best word today may be a rejected word tomorrow. So this is what the Bible says. When God created man, Genesis 5, 2, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. So that's our definition of the term man, and this is why we're using it. And this is the way we shall refer to humanity. What does it mean to be human is basically what we are exploring. So, what does it mean to be human, brothers? <laughs> well, I think the whole idea that man is made in the image of God is just as crucially important. Humanists, secular humanists, would deny that. They would say man has evolved from one celled amoeba <laughs> over eons of time. But uh, to think that a human being is made in the almighty creator's image gives him a tremendous amount of dignity and worth and value and sacredness that the secular humanist view absolutely does not have. So it's crucially important. So it's crucially for us important to understand what is the image of God in man. It, it also gives uh, <coughs> meaning for our our pretty much our life, the reason that we're created for the glory of God. Amen. So basically, we know why, and um, so basically, our existential questions get answered along the way by defining our nature or our <coughs> what it means to be human. So it answers um, a lot of questions, and then it rests human's heart to know that he's uh, he's for the uh, he's from God and by God and for God. So that's beautiful. So, so the image of God is that he's from God, by God, and for God. Is that? Yeah, I mean, God created us and for His glory, and we're to glory. Right, God that. created us for His glory. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We're going to talk about the beginning of man and this whole concept of being in the image of God, but that's where we find it, first mention of the Bible. And we find it, uh, the first mention that I find is in chapter 1, when God is uh, deciding to make man. Now, man, man here is made on the sixth day of creation, and he is made after... God has created the other creatures, specifically the land-producing creatures, livestock, etc. 
beginning at verse 24. And then it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So the creation of man is highlighted as being very special at the end of the creating cycle, and man is put in a position above the other creatures, all other creatures. So we have two categories of beings in the universe. We have God and we have creatures. So God is the uncreated one and anything that is was created by God. And man is a creature, so he's not God, though God is made him. But he said, let us make him in our image and our likeness. And the first thing he says with the indication of this is, is let them rule. So man having dominion in God's stead over the earth constitutes part of what it means to be in the image of God. I mean, as far as I can see, that's part of what the text is saying. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's not all the text is saying, but that seemed to be true, that man is the head, that he is given rule and representation, and he does so in the name of God. He's, in essence, God's vice regent on earth. Image bearing. Well, if we can see our image, where can we see our image as humans? Where can we see our image? Our image? You mean like uh, children? Well, that could be one way, right? <laughs> In other words, when, when, when people reproduce and they have children, the children bear the image of their parents, and we can see likeness in them. Uh, it varies, and sometimes there'll be, I can see more one parent than the other parent, and even among siblings there can be differences, but there seems to be, uh, usually, we would say, I can see likenesses between you and your brother. I can see that your brothers, that you have a number of characteristics that are alike, reflecting of your father. But where else do we see our image? We can see it where? Our image uh, in relation to how we were created in God's image? No, just our image. Where, where do you see your image? Well, in a physical way, in a mirror. Okay, that's right. <laughs> there you go. If you go. If you take a bath, take a shower, take off all your clothes, you're naked, you're all right, in front of a mirror, you can see yourself. There's your image. There you are. There's you. It looks like you, but there's a difference between what you see in the mirror and you, I mean, it's, there's, there's a likeness and there's a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the likeness is if you're seeing physically what you look like, but you can't see internally, you know. But God can see both the outward and the inward. In image bearing, it seems to me that we both are bearing an outward resemblance to God, but not, not that God is a physical being as we are, except in the incarnation, in Christ he became that. But in the Old Testament, there's anthropological terms used of God, and so in some sense, the, the anthropological reality of us must reflect something about that's true about God. I think Frame is, is bringing that out when, it, when he talks about the fact that the Bible talks about the hand of God, the arm of God, the eye of God, but it's not necessarily talking about God having a physical eye like we have, but it indicates that God has vision, that he sees all. 
or that God has strength and he's able to, to bring about things. So the physically standing for capabilities or powers. So in this case... Uh, and he's borrowing from Klein when he says that, right? On page 88? Yes. So in this case, uh, um, think from a uh, friend's perspective, he's saying that uh, God's attributes kind of reflects our our function for as a human. For instance, our makeup. Our makeup. Mm -hmm. Well, he quotes Merit, Merit Klein, or quotes, or at least he cites Merit Klein, a man the image of God. He says that Klein has shown us that the Bible presents three aspects of the image <laughs> which correspond to the lordship attributes and to the three perspectives that Frame says we've talked about in chapter 6. First, the image of God is physical bodily. The human eye is an image of God's power to see. As the psalmist says, he who formed the eyes, does he not see? Mm -hmm. Psalm 94.9. God doesn't have literal eyes, but except in the incarnation he did in Jesus Christ. But our eyes reflect his power of sight. Similarly, Scripture speaks of God's arm and hand, indicating his power to act and showing that our arms and hands are also images of him. People sometimes object to saying that the image of God is physical because God doesn't have a body, but that's short-sighted. God doesn't have a body, but our bodies certainly reflect his power. This aspect of the image of God reflects his lordship attribute of control, or what we call in chapter 6 the situational perspective. Well, he goes on in his citing of Klein and his agreement with him that the second aspect of the image of God, man, the image of God, is the official God holds the office of the king, so he makes his assistant kings, his vice regents are regents to have dominion over the earth, from what we read in Genesis 1, 26 and 28. This reflects God's lordship attribute of authority. And then the third element is the ethical element. The New Testament specifically tells us that we reflect God's image in our knowledge, our righteousness and holiness in Ephesians 4, 24 and Colossians 3, 10. So what do those passages say? And throughout Scripture, God tells us to be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, Leviticus 19.2. So what does Ephesians 4.24 say? Or what does Colossians 3.10 say? He goes on, the image of God extends to our inmost character. And this corresponds to God's lordship attribute of presence. So Ephesians 4.24 says that, and to put to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness of and holiness. All right, so he's talking about putting on the new mm -hmm. and to put to put on an, uh, the new self created the new self created after the likeness of God after the likeness in of true God. righteousness and holiness. So there he's talking about regeneration. He's talking about the new creature. Creation that comes about by God's saving work in the life of a man. And this is like a renewal of what it means to be in the image of God. Mm -hmm. I really understand that right? Colossians 3.10, what does that say? It says, uh, And put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, after the image of its creator. So, knowledge is part of what it means to be in the image of God the intellect, the mental capacities and powers. But, but animals have some, some sense. They have uh, some of this. But man seems to be in a category of his own, above the animals. Where, where do we see that? I mean, for instance, let's say uh, uh, when we see Felicity, she knows you guys. And, yeah. And if there's another person... For instance, she was barking when I was coming. Uh -huh. So in that, they have a sense of understanding, but they do not have the uh, the ultimate knowledge of, like for instance, they cannot know God. Like uh, I think uh, the EP Gnosis, uh, like knowing God as God, so they, they do not have that kind of privilege. To, so I think uh, when he says the knowledge here mm. indicates that to know God, so the knowing, uh, like the, to know God by the grace of 
by His grace, mm. and to recognize that. So, so kind of to have this fellowship with Him, so animals can have fellowship with God like we do. So uh, I think that's what distinguishes us. Well, where, 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 where do we see the superiority of man over other, over, over other creatures? What do we have that they don't have? We have a, a moral sense of right and wrong. All right, so ethically, we're talking about what you're talking about, righteousness there. Mm -hmm. Now, mankind has the power of speech. Now, we do know that there are animals that have the power of communication, but communication and human speech are... Uh, human speech is a form of communication, and you can have communication without human speech, but human speech enables us to do something that it doesn't appear that animals... Do, and that is abstract thought and the communication of ideas one to another this idea of uh, it's built on I think the, if, the number of animals have more abilities than maybe we ever thought they did have but mankind still seems to be in a, in a position of superiority and in a uniqueness that they do not share and I'm assuming we're assuming to say part of that is being that we're made in the image of God. Okay, well, man's made in the image of God at the beginning, and we know and next time we're going to be discussing sin and what sin is and where it came from, etc. But we know from the account in Genesis 3 that mankind disobeyed God, he fell, and he was cast out of the garden. So, the question is, at the fall, did man lose the image of God or does he still retain the image of God and is he in the whole image of God or is there something wrong with his image bearing of God? Those are all questions that we have to ask. There would be some who say that man was made originally in the image of God but when he sinned and was cast out of the garden, he lost the image of God entirely. Yeah, um, I think there is some teaching that says that when we sin, we lose our image of God. But, um, well, that, 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 because uh, if we have, if we lost it, I don't think Jesus would have come to save us. Because if we lost because of our image of God, and we're, we lost our, basically our nature, so what's the purpose of Jesus? go through all the suffering to, to mm. kind of save all this irredeemable people so if we were uh, so basically that we are corrupted so our image is for instance let's say if I if some if somebody gets in accident for instance and then loses his his uh, um, uh, like physical form and, but he doesn't lose his identity or he doesn't lose the internal image for instance he just loses whatever he can see in the mirror, but he cannot lose his sense. Like for instance, his identity, the very main identity. So hmm. I, I don't think we can lose our image of God. So basically, our uh, yeah, he, he created us, and then he cannot just erase us and then and make us another kind of uh, animal-like people or creature. So it, it contradicts when. Whenever I try to think that way, and then uh, uh, and then think that to try to imagine that Jesus came to save us, and uh, for the lost images mm. and irredeemable broken. I mean, we're broken, but we're not irredeemable. That's why he he came to pay the price for us. So the image of God in us is broken, but not destroyed. Is that mm. what you're saying? There you go. Yeah. It's distorted, but still, in some sense, yes, present. Yes, present. Well, we don't really have to guess about that, because the Bible itself gives us the answer to that. After the flood, mm -hmm. after there's a second beginning of mankind, with Noah, the Adam race has a second beginning. We had it in, in Adam. The flood came, so the worldwide flood, and then only, only Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives survive. So the human race starts over again with Noah and his children. And then it says in Genesis uh, chapter 9 
verse uh, 4, it begins with, But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. Now this is after he's given... At the beginning, mankind was given only a, a, a plant, vegetation, diet. But after the flood, he was also given a meat diet. Uh, that's what's found in Genesis chapter 9. Everything that has lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Mm. So, but you must not eat the meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. Interesting. And from each man too, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. And here's the clincher, because this is a principle statement, a theological statement. For whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. But this is where we get the idea that capital punishment was ordained by God for certain crimes, such as the crime of murder, deliberate murder, because it's a destruction of man who's been made in the image of God. So here, mankind still retains some, some of the image of God, though there's something wrong with the image because we sin. We're not in true righteousness and holiness, as it says in the, in the New Testament, where we are being created that way uh, as a result of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. But we do retain the image of God in some respect. Well, one very obvious way that the image of God is seen as maintained as our even after man became sin, sinful we still communicate speech okay uh -huh. animals don't have speech well and, and uh, they have communication there's the moral sense is still there uh, there's a degree of love that mm -hmm. still remains like Parental love for their children and so forth, you know. So there are still reflections of God even in sinful lost humanity. But the animals also show affection for their offspring. Certain animals do. So, you know, I don't know if we can make such a huge demarcation between man and the animals here. In so many of the areas, animals do reflect some of these same things. But uh, do, do, they, do they have the sense of morality? For instance, if we see people who, like for instance, let's say the um, the naturalist people, for instance, they, they don't live where uh, created in the image of God, and they just mm -hmm. believe that we were just evolved from some sort of uh, creatures. But they have a sense of morality, and I don't think animals can have conscious decision of a sense of morality, so that distinguishes us, yes, from, from animals. So, and then that also shows that we have the image of God, even if we deny it in our, in our understanding, but we do have it inside of us. Even Paul, in um, I think it's in Romans, maybe, uh, he says that uh, to the people who do not have law, they have law inside them. So this it's is Romans chapter 2. two. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, we're creatures made in the image of God, and the, this gives us a great dignity. We have great dignity in God's sight, so much so that he sends his son to redeem us. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say that about the animals. He does say that about mankind. So we've discovered that God's image means, in one way, it means dominion, to be, had, to be Lord over the rest of the earth, that God created us in a special way. Now, we see, we see that in the formation of mankind, both the male, Adam, the first male, it says that God created him from the dust of the earth. He formed him from the dust of the earth. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being, became a living soul. Well, it's just man at first. And then after Adam goes away and he... Uh, start giving names to all the different creatures. God then makes woman from man. He 
takes woman from man, creates her from man. He created man, Adam, and then he creates Eve from Adam. And so then the two of them together constitute an image of God. They're both in the image of God. Both of them are made in the image of God. Adam was directly and Eve was indirectly because she's made in the image of Adam as well as the image of God. And then their children then are born in their image and their likeness mm -hmm. and they're reflecting also something of the image of God. And this is retained to some degree even after the fall of mankind into sin. But there's obviously something wrong with this image of God, man, is it's it's not what it should be because we do not bring God the glory that we should. Uh, so if, if we're looking for a, an image, if, if you have a child in your image, you want that child to reflect well on you, not bad. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, and when we look in a mirror, we want the image of the mirror to reflect good on us, not bad. So if it's distorted, you know, then it, it makes us look distorted. Uh, so part of the image of, of God in man seems to be that we are made so that we can glorify God. And the Westminster Catechism picks that up in its very first question, what is the chief end or the chief purpose of man? It answers, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And to glorify God is to reflect back to Him His own glory his own love, his own knowledge and power so that he rejoices in us. To glorify God is to image him clearly so that the world may see his glory in us. I thought that was a very well stated remark on page 86. Uh, and this is reflected in Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? The psalmist is saying, there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So mankind is made to live in communion with God and to enjoy God, to have a rich fellowship of God. And that's really what salvation is about, restoring that kind of relationship with God. Yes? We can see in this very psalm you just read, 73, that here's being written, I forget, maybe David wrote this psalm, but there's a personal relationship between mm -hmm. man and God. Mm -hmm. It continues. It's vital. It's dynamic. These psalmists had a vital relationship with God. They were fallen men, but yet they were still in active relationship with the, their Creator. So that shows mm -hmm. in that God is still existent. Well, you know, Psalm 8 and then Hebrews 2 speaks of something about the nature of God, uh, the nature of man being in the image of God. And the fact that Jesus came to restore all that in Hebrews chapter 2. You know, God did not send Jesus Christ to redeem angels nor to redeem animals, but he did send him to redeem mankind. Well, he does pick up the idea about creation and evolution. And there are those who say that mankind is simply a product of an involvement. Uh, we descended from animals. Uh, well, we say we're de descended, or maybe we were ascended, <laughs> however we want to look at it. Uh, but that's not how the Bible presents the creation of man. Uh, whatever modifications may occur in mankind and animals due to changes of environment, food, etc., it does not ever bridge it over, over from one kind to another, from one species to another. You know, we, we, we tend to retain within us certain... We have the human species, you have the, you know, canine, you have different things. Uh, they don't, they don't, you don't see them coming from one to another. Or you don't see an end of one, the beginning of another, or some in-between in, in form. But regardless of all of that, uh, the, the limits that, are, that changes are brought about by natural reproduction. In the Bible, mankind is presented as being miraculously created by God directly Adam and then indirectly but still a miraculous act by Eve from mankind's own body from Adam's own body 
she is made. Man, the image of God. We've already discussed some of that. The image of God may be retained, is retained after the fall, but it's not the same. It has been altered. It has been defaced, shall we say. And part of the whole redemptive act of Jesus Christ is to restore us to what God wants us to be. Now, there are other words used to describe mankind's special relationship to God besides this idea of image. So we want to discuss about what makes us human. Maybe we have to also look at other terms that the Bible uses to describe us in relationship to God. And some of those are that we are described as the servants of God. We are described, uh, at least Abraham was, and then Jesus with his disciples said they are the friends of God. Israel in, of old was called the wife of God, and the church is called the bride of Christ. Now what do all these images have in common? They are, um, so we are subject to, subjected to God, so his God is our pretty much our head, our, 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 our control, basically. Okay. So, and then we are to live for him. For instance, uh, the church is there to worship God and to, to kind of uh, worship God and then to, to lead people to the fullness of man, right? To, uh, to what they are called to. And then um, a wife is, uh, I mean, from biblical understanding perspective, I mean, from biblical worldview perspective, uh, is to, to respect and to be subjected to her wife, to her, her husband, rather. and uh, also a wife, of, obviously. And then also bride is also to, to be ready for her husband to, to be. So basically, she gets all this makeup and this... Um, so, so uh, everything is circled around God being, and then w us being ready and being subjected to God, is, is always. And then also our way of... of so you're talking about the headship principle. Mm -hmm. Authority yeah. coming from a head. From a, and then also the, our loyalty to him as well, because wife is supposed to be loyal to her husband, right? Well, it should be the reverse as well, should it? Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not questioning God's morality, so he's not corrupt, that's why. But, of course, as a, you know, a, a humanly speaking, yes, of course. Well, what I'm driving at, if we, if we use these terms, servants or sons and friends and wife and bride, we're all talking about intimate relationships. Exactly, yeah. We're talking about relationships of communication, communica of caring, of love, of mutual respect, and of a mutual interchange of life that results in fruitfulness toward others. All right, so God created man, male and female, and they both carry the image of God, right? Uh, so when the Bible talks about man being a head, it's not talking about him being a lord over the other, it is, it's some kind of despot, but it has to do with with a, a authoritarian structure, a structure for for family, for relationships, uh, different roles, not not different in dignity. Is that what we would? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you know the same hierarchical kind of thing is sometimes used with respect to God the Father and Jesus the Son. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is not less than or a different category of. So, you know, to, to honor the Father is to honor the Son, and vice versa. Jesus says it very plainly. So, uh, there's a reflection, even within the doctrine of the Trinity, of, the, of a hierarchy, but it's not a hierarchy of... of uh, I'm struggling for words here. It's not, it's not that one's the desperate ruler over the other. It's, it's that uh, there's an assignment of different roles with, with equal dignity. Right, what constitutes the human? How? What are the elements, the aspects of the human? That's that's another 
big question where we deal with mankind. Now, there have been different views that have been given. One is the view, uh, well, it all goes to what do we mean by saying that man's made in the image of God, and what does it mean that, that God breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living soul? That passage just says things. he became a living creature. He came alive. It doesn't go on and explain more. It doesn't necessarily give, give us a whole lot more than that. But there are times in the scripture that this word soul and the word spirit are used throughout the Bible and we have to interpret them contextually, it appears. Because... We, we can't necessarily just have one particular meaning and we say that's what it always means. Because sometimes it may mean simply the, the animation, animating principle, but other times there seems to be a distinction between the body and soul. and seems to be uh, a way in which they can be separated if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there seems to be some kind of implication there. Uh, if you look at Luke 16, where Jesus talks about the rich man and the beggar Lazarus and their state after death, or when you look at Jesus' statements in Matthew, I think it's 10, where he talks about, you know, you can fear, fear those who can, who can destroy the body, but... You should have a greater fear of he who can destroy both soul and body in hell. There seems to be a distinction that can be made uh, where, you know, that would be nonsense if Jesus is only saying they can take the breath out of you. So soul or spirit cannot simply mean always the breath of man. It has to, it has to mean a whole lot more than that. There's, there are numerous scripture verses. It says here, the word soul can also refer to a person's existence apart from the body as also the word spirit. And then he cites numerous scripture translations, which we can't really uh, do, read all those now. But he goes with Matthew 26, 41 and 27, 50. I don't know exactly what those say. Luke twenty four thirty nine. That's his Christ on the cross, isn't it? Resurrection afterwards. Uh, what does it say? Resurrection afterwards. John nineteen thirty. I know. What's what's the mean? What's the content of the verse? I have to look it up. Well, he te- he te- he tells the disciples, "Do you have anything here to eat?" Mm-hmm. And um, then he took something and he ate it. And he was to demonstrate to them that he was to resurrected bodily, with a body that could still eat. Uh, you know, and he said, you know, the spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. So Jesus has made a distinction, and in that statement, he's saying spirit would not would not could not be translated as breath. So there's some kind of animated, some kind of existence that's being referred to there. And there's other passages relating in this area. Uh, did you find one of those passages of scripture? Twenty-four thirty-nine says, "See my hands and my feet. This, that is, I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have." So Jesus made a distinction between the body there and the spirit. Okay, and we know the angels are spirit, spirit creatures. So mankind is both body, soul, and spirit. Now there's the, there's the view that man is three parts which is trichonomous. I believe that the word spirit, soul, and body refer to very different, distinct elements of our nature. There are two or three passages of Scripture that refer to this or refer or uses this terminology. But that does not necessarily mean that soul and spirit are totally distinct because the terms are used many places interchangeably. So even if there can be some kind of a distinction made between them, they're not saying that the one would exist apart from the other, that the spirit would exist apart from the soul, or the soul from the spirit. Then there are creationists. Where does the soul come from? In this view, the soul is made, every man's individual soul is made 
at the point of reproduction by God. The other view is that a traductionist, which believes that our soul is inherited from our parents as our body is. So I can remember having this discussion in seminary class one day. Uh, creationists claim that you know each one of us is uh, an individual creation of God, but to me, I think that scripturally we inherit from Adam and we are descended from our parents on both body and soul. So, you know, we can may make some distinctions, uh, but I would think the scripture seems to support the traduction is view more than the other. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> uh, well, go ahead. I, I haven't studied this out, but it seems to me like every fetus in the womb is a direct, God's hand is directly involved there. It's not just a merely human process going on, but there's divine intervention into this little life mm. in some way or another. You base that on what? <laughs> overall knowledge <laughs> of scripture. I think uh, we can also base it on <laughs> Psalms 39. He says that he knit me and uh, knit me together in my 139, you mean? What is it? 130, what? What? What did I say? 39. Oh, 30, 139. Um, so basically, and then also, when we see, this could be irrelevant, but um, this is, I think, my observation based on the creation, basically, when he said, uh, when he created man on his image, and then, like, he didn't say he made a, uh, Eve out of, uh, like, in the image of Adam, but he said that he created, but, but he did make Eve in the image of Adam. He took her out of Adam. But he, he says that she is created in the image of God, not in the image of God. I mean, in a sense. Well, he says together they are the image they, of God. Yeah. So there's a, All right, but now when they had children, what does it say? If we go back to the beginning of Adam lay with his wife Eve, she became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Mm. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. So, Cain and Abel and all the other children that come from Adam and Eve were made in the image of Adam and Eve. We're made in the image of our parents. I, I believe that this... This supports more of the view that the body and the soul come from the from the power that God has put within us to reproduce after our kind. Traductionist. Well, I don't know that we can ever totally 100% you know, we, because since the scriptures can be cited on both sides of this, uh, but traduction is appealed to Genesis 1, 24 through 27, and Hebrews 17, 7, verse 10. What does Hebrews 7, verse 10 say? Uh, all right. Then we talk about the capabilities of man. Let's go to that. Hebrews 7, chapter 7, verse 10, Hebrews. For he was still in the loins of his ancestors when Melchizedek. Melchizedek. He's talking about Levi there, right? Mm -hmm. he, he was in the loins of his ancestor. Well, that's the reproductive part of, mm -hmm. of humanity. We carry 
the seed in us and pass the seed on to our offspring. Uh, and I think that supports the body soul coming down this way rather than each one of us being an individual creation of God. All right, but let's look at uh, the elements of man. And we, we talk about his body, we talk about man's mind. What is the mind? <laughs> we know it's a, in a physical organ, right? In the body. And we know that it has electrical impulses and chemical impulse. Chemicals that trigger electrical impulses that control bodily movement, speech, thinking, etc. If you damage a part of the brain, then certain aspects of the body are, are damaged as a result of that. So we know there's this total interplay between mind and body. But we usually list the elements of the mind as intellect, will and emotions, all of this making up what it means to be a human. And the, our will is our ability to choose, our ability to act. Our emotions are our abilities to feel. And uh, our mind our intellect is our ability to think, to process mental thoughts and communication, both uh, abstract and non-abstract. But if this constitutes men, mankind, we are all fallen and our minds are in need of redemption. We have to have a work done on our minds, and that's, I think that's certainly supported in the Bible that with the, with regeneration, with the work of the Holy Spirit and connecting us to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you know, we, we have this uh, charge, uh, Romans chapter 12 says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So mankind, in the act of salvation, regeneration, his mind needs to be reformed, reformed in accordance with the Word of, word of God, the will of God, and that uh, is the Holy Spirit's work within us, transforming our minds to be more like the mind of Christ, and more in line with the... Can, can you... These are all capacities that man has, but they are all mutually independent. They are dependent, not independent. They're not, none of them are independent. They're mutually dependent upon one another. To, in, to involve in one also involves the other. They're intertwined. Intertwined, yes. Three perspectives, he says, on a whole person as he thinks, acts, and feels. Now, we, the Bible uses another term referring to mankind. And it tends to be a, a term that talks about the unity of a person's being. What, what is that word? Heart. The heart. Okay. Now, we know it's not just talking about the physical organ in our body called the heart. There's a heart here that he doesn't do any thinking. The thinking is up here <laughs> in the brain. Uh, so, you know, but the heart is used as a, a term to signify the, the center of man's being and the unity of his nature. So Proverbs 4.23 reads, Keep your heart with all vig vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So the heart is the center of our personality. 
is the part is who we are when all the masks are off. The heart is who you really are and truly are as God sees you and as you, in some respect, can see yourself, though we never fully understand ourselves either, it seems to me. <laughs> there are depths of our own self-knowledge that we seem to. You know, it seems to be beyond uh, our I think it was a couple of months ago I was reading this uh, uh, about an uh, East African philosopher from 17th century. Uh -huh. And he was advocating about the rationality of the heart. He said, um, so basically, it's close to this text, and then he said, the mm -hmm. heart is the center uh, of our identity, he said. Yeah, the center of our identity. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. All right, we have to deal with human freedom and responsibility. If God makes something happen, how can we be free? And if we're not free, if God controls all our thoughts and decisions, how can we be responsible for what we do? So we, we're dealt here with this dilemma. We know that God is presented in Scripture as sovereign. The one who has all authority and control and ability. And yet man is made in the image of God and we have responsibility before God and we're held accountable for our actions. And harmonizing these concepts is always posed as a challenge to mankind. So if man is just totally free, what does that mean? means that uh, he doesn't have any, any restriction. So All right, no restraints, no restrictions. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants to do it. Is that really man? <laughs> That's, uh, that could be, no, because he, even if, if he thinks or she thinks that they don't have any restriction, their nature would restrict them, for instance. Okay, our nature tends to restrict them. Mm -hmm. So, I think we, we have to understand that human freedom does exist in some way, in some mm -hmm. respect. The scriptures do present that, but how, in what way? Now, there are different views that are given. Uh, he, he mentions them. One of them, he says, is uh, libertarianism libertarianism the concept teaches that free human acts are not caused by anything at all not by God not by our character or our desires if you do something because you want to do it then the libertarian would tell you that it's not a free choice because you wanted to do it. So I don't know how this thing exists. It seems to be an illogical position to of, take. It's kind of self-defeating, by the way. They, yes. they just bring one logic in here and then they just cancel it on the other side. So it's, hmm. how is your, how does your desire <laughs> So they would say that your free choice is independent of your desires. But it seems to me that your your choices are actually a carrying out of your desires. Yeah, but how, how can it be possible? To do what? Based it on their logic. I mean, based it on... Well, I don't, think, I don't think their position, that position uh, is operable, period. Mm -hmm. It seems to be just some kind of a theory oh, okay. because I, I don't see how, how it's worked. Desires do influence... Our decision now the libertarian would view that desires may influence your final decision but if they compel it then the decision is not free so I could go against my desire he points out that scripture neither commends this kind of freedom nor even mentions it human actions are not completely uncaused. They are caused. They can't be divorced from our character or our desires. They're not just random actions. And if that were the case, then we could never be held responsible for anything. So, 
he points out, or he says, in my judgment, Frame is saying, libertarian freedom is not the ground of moral responsibility. Indeed, it destroys moral responsibility. So he goes for the view of com compatibilist freedom. In other words, a human action can be both free and caused. Your actions can be free even if you want to do them, even if they are motivated by your character, even if they are foreordained by God. This is a strange kind of freedom, he says, but it's not strange at all. It's simply the ability to do what we want to do. This is usually what we use the term freedom to mean in everyday speech. I'm free when I can do whatever I want to do. Um, so our, our freedom is limited by our character and by our choices, and by our desires. It's very difficult for a person to act contrary to their desires. When sin wins out, is it not because at that moment the desire for that forbidden is greater than the desire not to do it. Yes. Uh, I mean, if if we're involved in the thinking process at all. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, even for a Christian, for instance, let's say, uh, this, a person who is uh, who is saved by the, uh, by the grace of God, and, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we quite often fall in sin. And we know it's wrong, but somehow we just give in to the, the desire. Or mm -hmm. so, um, we can, if, if, we were to, uh, to, if we were to give excuse for why we fall into that sort of sin, we would give a bunch of excuses, but also we're responsible to resist it because we're given the power to do so. So, so basically, we're even... Uh, I guess to call it uh, uh, Paul from uh, his uh, like, uh, letter to the, the Romans, Roman, chapter, chapter seven. seven, yeah, <laughs> and also <laughs> Augustine uh, for his uh, confession, his book in the confession, uh -huh. he said that Paul said that uh, I do the things that I don't, uh, I don't, I mean, I do not like to do. Basically, he's he's doing things against his kind of. Desire basically because of the uh, he just can uh, cannot resist the that thing that he can he don't he does not want to do, and I even uh, uh, Augustine said that I am torn apart basically. I want to do this, but I'm quite often uh, pulled toward this one, uh -huh. so I'm kind of. Well, I think he was saying after Paul there. Yeah, the, he was quoting him, uh, but he, he was just mm -hmm. emphasizing more on the turn, the turn apart. So, in that sense, we are, uh, our desire sometimes could be on this side, and then... We, we can we have contrary desires? We can have contrary desires, can we not? Of course we can. And when we have contrary desires, the strongest desire at the moment is the one that's going to win. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, that's more of uh, <laughs> for even uh. guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Bible doesn't make clear that man's been responsible for his actions. Though. Right. The Bible's clear of that. But the Bible also makes distinctions mm -hmm. in the de the degree of responsibility. For instance, the Bible seems to make allowance for ignorance. Mm -hmm. In other words, if a person acts in ignorance as, as opposed to a person that acts in full knowledge, the one that acts in ignorance is not as held as culpable as the one who acts in the full knowledge of what he's doing. Uh, and Jesus uses that in Luke 12 when he talks about punishment, about servants doing their master's will. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will receive a severe beating, but the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating would receive a lighter beating. So there seems to be that ignorance is a mitigating factor in God's judgment, though ju judgment still remains for both. Well, you brought up um, the concept of freedom in mankind the stages of mankind. Now, 
I think it's Thomas Boston that had a famous book called The Fourfold State of Man, a Puritan writer. And he's reflecting here what you're alluding to in Augustine in the four stages. Augustine's not alone. There are others who trace the process of the liberation of man, that is, man in relationship to freedom and sin into four different categories. The original state of man in the Garden of Eden before the fall we call it the state of innocence in which Adam and Eve were created good. In fact, God says it is very good. But although they were created good, they were capable of being tempted and capable of falling into sin. So they are, I can't pronounce my, my Latin here, posse pocaire, Okay. It's, a it's possible to sin. Uh, they were good, but able, able to sin. The second stage is after the fall, mankind, beginning with Adam and Eve, and all since then, except for Jesus Christ himself, who is the incarnate Son of God, is created or, or exists in a state of bondage the bondage of the will. Our will is in bondage to the bad. It's in bondage to sin, evil. And we're unable to do anything good in the total sense of good that totally to pleases God for his honor and glory. Because we're 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 not we're not we're not able not to sin. So the second is the bondage created by the fall by which we become bad and unable to do anything good. Not able not to sin. That's the state of man before redemption in Christ. The third is the work of the Spirit's regeneration on the basis of Christ's work which begins at the moment of regeneration. It makes it possible for us not to sin. We can do good, and it's possible for us not to sin. It's possible, mm -hmm. not probable, being in this fallen world and state. And last is our existence in glory, in which we will be good, again, but not able to sin. In other words, what's going to be different between the state of Adam and Eve in the garden and our state in the regenerate state on the new heaven and new earth is that Adam and Eve were created good with the ability to sin, but when we are recreated at the resurrection of the dead and totally redeemed body, soul, and spirit in the image of God in, in Jesus Christ our Lord, we will be good and no longer able to sin. Never again will sin afflict us or the human race. All right, well, we have the image of God as what constitutes the nature of man. We have the image of God of what is man's task, what is man to do in the world. We, we go back to that in Genesis 1, and we've already discussed the fact that he has given, been given dominion by God in which he is to subject the creation, obviously for the benefit of mankind and for the glory of God. So this is what we call the cultural mandate, of the creation mandate. We're, we have the creation mandate is to reproduce, to fill the earth with humans, uh, but all other creatures also were told to, told to fill the earth. And in this world, in this created order, mankind is to have dominance, but it's not a dominance of just, just it's a dominance to build, the dominance to rule in the name of God and for the glory of God and for the benefit of mankind. Uh, but in the new covenant with the coming of Christ and with the regenerate man, that is, we who are the disciples of Christ, the ones who are considered to be the bride of Christ, etc., we have another mandate. And that is also the mandate to reproduce. 
but it's not the physical reproduction it's talking about here, but it's spiritual reproduction. The mandate to carry the gospel of the life-giving message of Jesus Christ to, to, the, to the dying world and hold out you know, this, this offer this, of, of eternal life through, through faith in Jesus Christ. And we act as God's ambassadors in this world he doesn't take it up a lot necessarily in this chapter, but he alludes to the fact that of the what we call the offices of Christ, are they not offices of mankind at the beginning? That is, the kingly role, the prophetic role, and the priestly role. Man created in the image of God, you know, he was to be the worshiper of God. Uh, he was to be the ruler over the created order that God has placed him in but he does so in the name of God for the glory of God uh, and it's, a, it's a, a role that involves the transmission of knowledge etc in, in Jesus Christ uh, these roles are very present these offices he is our prophet, priest and king and as Christians we also reflect that in our relationship uh, to God and to one another and in the body of Christ uh, so if we want to really know what the image of God is like it seems the New Testament points us to a particular person mm -hmm. in the Old Testament you know we're pointing back to Adam Adam is the one made created in the image of God and then even Noah who is the continuation of that image but he's fallen and that's some, right after the fall you know he, he gets butt naked drunk and etc uh so, you know, mankind has a new start, but he's starting off with sin again. Uh, but in the New Testament, we're pointing to Jesus Christ, who is the true and perfect image of God. And so to be conformed to the image of Christ is to be being made and remade in the image of God. And when that process is totally complete at the resurrection and the consummation of all things, and we shall reflect the true image of God in all of its glory uh, as we reflect the image of Christ our Lord, who is the Son of the Eternal and who is the true, truest representation of humanity and who is God's image in the highest sense. At the end, God will have a people the land, the whole earth, and they will all live in prosperity, a new heaven and a new earth uh, for all eternity. Man in the image of God. Well, you know, this is an important concept because when we deal with sin, we're talking about the destruction, the damage done to the image of God. When we're talking about redemption, we're talking about what God does in order to bring man back to the image in which he was first created. So it takes up uh, the narrative, uh, the redemptive narrative at the beginning. We, we begin here, there's a descent from it, but we come back to it in Christ. Well, our next chapter is on sin and evil. Uh, that's something we, we have a little bit of experience with, so I guess we'll be able to talk about that. <laughs> All right, Jeff, you lead us in prayer? Okay. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this chapter, for John Frame's work, and guiding us to thinking biblically about our humanness, that we've been created in your image and bestowed with certain uh, intellectual, spiritual powers and sensitivities that the animals don't have that reflect you, our Creator, uh, we thank you for uh, the growth that we experience having been regenerated by the Spirit and growing as Christians in the renewal of our minds by the Word of God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, the perfect man, mm -hmm. the perfect image of you and human nature that is our example as well as our Savior. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have uh, ordained that, that we grow as Christians and that we subdue the earth through the gospel preaching that men and women everywhere might uh, come to know you, the true and living God. Uh, thank you, Lord, for creating us, for giving, giving us life, yes. for creating us in your image so that we bear uh, much of your image in our own persons. And we thank you that there's a day coming when all the corruption and sin will be done away with and we will be uh, perfect humans uh, because of your grace and purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, we bless and thank you. Uh, may many more people, Lord, come to understand these great truths. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, next time we'll take up again a discussion on salvation belongs to the Lord. A book by John M. Frame, Introduction to Systematic Theology.